Okay. Oh, but close enough. Um, Carmine's in art. Y'all, get back in here. You're very loud right outside. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. All uh, right, I'll just talk. Um, this is a pretty art lang heavy crowd, um, as are uh, most of the people online. Uh, on the online list, at least, are art langers. I am an art angel langer. Sorry. Um, but uh, I'd like to have a few people who are um, even more into the art side of things uh, talk a bit about. Um, you wrote a book, a uh, novel indeed. Uh, you two made a movie. You're writing a book. And you two have this uh, internet art project. Um, so if you would please just uh, say one minute about um, what you did um, in terms of the artistic element, um, and then just start asking each other questions. Have fun. Um, before my own stuff, I, I just want to say I have heard so many and seen so many gorgeous things between the orthographies and, and today, especially the um, spoken and sung languages. And I think we need uh, not only Conlang the movie, but we need Conlang the DVD with the beautiful sound and music, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I really think we should be considering some, you know, a series of anthologies, you know, and, and putting this stuff together because it really is uh, beautiful art as well as, as language. So anyhow, my own work, I wrote a novel. Uh, the language <clears throat> came into being uh, with the novel. It split off from the novel. I started examining it on its own and making software. And now I do like video, live video uh, performance <clears throat> with that software. And uh, I'll, I'll post something um, on the site or something about this next performance <clears throat> in New York and Brooklyn on April 12th. And, probably at 8 o'clock, and it's his issue project room, but I don't even have the address information to give you. And I, I don't know, it's just all of a piece. I mean, for me, it's like um, trying, there's some basic concept about language that then gets expressed in in many different formats. And, and then I, uh, I don't see any particular end to that. It's, it's got to do with multiple voices to get something across. <coughs> Um, I uh, got uh, interested in languages, uh, not, not languages in general, but uh, conlangs uh, through watching Star Trek when I was a kid. Yeah. And um, I was really interested in all that. Um, and also later on I learned about Esperanto and Tolkien. And then finally I um, saw the, uh, the Zombist BB and I that's sort of where it took off in 2003, I guess. Um, and for, to me, it's it's art as any other, even though it's kind of obscure and new. And even it's not that new. We have the Wundi um, manuscript, and we have all kinds of stuff. But people have been doing this for a long time. But with the internet, um, it's sort of Yes. Um, and materialized in a, in a way that's more obvious. And um, I was involved in uh, the movie Conline, um, you know, in that I created the language that was used, even though it's um, not specifically created for the movie. Um, and that, that was quite fun to have your language published in that particular way. Um, yeah, um, that's just... Well, um, my name is Walter and I, I wrote and produced the movie Call Lime that uh, Kevin is speaking of. Um, I myself am not a call I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm, a, I'm very interested in uh, languages and, and now 
uh, especially after this conference, I find myself even more fascinated by uh, Conlang, and, and who knows, maybe we'll see Conlang, a uh, feature length movie, <laughs> someday, uh, if anybody wants to uh, invest money to have that made. Mm -hmm. I don't know, in today's economy, if, if Conlang is top of the list priority. Uh, Series. Or a TV series, even better. <laughs> um, requires a larger viewing audience, however. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that's how I ended up uh, on this panel. Um, I think we should just pass it along. <laughs> um, I'm Jeff Burke. Um, I, the, you, for me, uh, the development of my conlines has always gone hand in hand with uh, the, the world in which they originate and grow and unfold. Um, uh, the, the, my, the, the particular world in which my continents uh, are, you know, exist and are set is called this area. It is a, um, a fictional vision of North America, approximately sometime in the Pleistocene, uh, the geography is uh, quite a bit different from today. Um, and the, the culture, it, it, I, I was asked up here because I'm writing a book set in this area called The Spirit Weaver, which makes extensive use of my conlines mostly for place and personal names because readers, for the most part, are intolerant of long texts in foreign languages. Uh, you know, at, at this point, there are a couple of very short texts in the book. Uh, the book is about uh, somewhere around half completed at the moment. I've been working on it for quite a while. I expect to finish sometime late this summer or fall um, if things keep going as they do. Um, and I'm just going to keep passing it along. Hi, my name is Samantha, and I'm here with Edrix. We're working on a project. We're new to this community, but we're artists who work in digital media and creative writing who are using common lines in our art. And it's very inspired by just the, some of the forms that some of these languages took and the rich way they evolved, um, the meaning that they created and how they made new meaning as they were kind of augmented and added to, and the types of things you could, the types of uh, impressions they would leave on the mind depending on how they were arranged, and using that to kind of do a project about um, communication and miscommunication through the use of an internet international office language. Edrix? Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, go ahead. Um, Edrix Fontanelia, it's Samantha Gordon. Um, I mentioned before that I had, in the past few years, collaborated with neuroscientist Robert Goldschmidt on um, video art sculptures. And um, you know, he's, he's very much uh, invested in rule-based uh, approaches in art making. And we both, um, we're very much invested in how the mind does an amazing job uh, reifying, you know, recognizing patterns, and and how that um, very much affects people's worldview. Um, and that's very much we were very much concerned with um, the physiological aspects of, of that experience and how that implicates the viewer. Um, and but but deep inside, I always had um, an interest in. Um, how that happens conceptually. Um, I think of Camille Utterback's text frame piece, reading reading text with, <laughs> with the body. And I have to thank Sam and, and now um, this community for offering such great perspectives and opportunities about um, how exactly we can explore um, you know, different perspectives as as affected by language and you know, perspectives of, of worldview. So um, absolutely, this is at the core of uh, what we're actively trying to um, uh, explore visually and, and through the interaction. So, so thank you. So uh, any questions about the panelists? Uh, wait, uh, do you have Stephen Travis? Oh, I have, oh, Travis. 
Oh, I totally forgot. Oh, uh, thank you, Travis, or Steven. Thank you for coming on the phone. Um, yeah, so I just have like a question. Hey, Steven, you there? Steven. Yeah. Sorry? Good. Hi there. Um, you're now on the panel. Howdy. Hi. I, you know what I did? I just uh, turned off the live simulcast and it seemed to have gotten rid of that noise. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, don't try to listen to this on Skype and on the simulcast. Also, please wear headphones. Um, uh, yeah, well, there's not much we can do about that one, unfortunately. So, uh, if you would please say one minute about um, how you uh, use comlines and RTC. Well, I I generally like to combine language a uh, com link with art because for me they they uh, pretty much come from the same place. Um, uh, since I was a little kid, I've always enjoyed uh, building cities in the backyard and uh, making languages for them, and so it kind of evolved that way where they they kind of went hand in hand. And I, I guess one of the things I like most about it is, um, in both cases, there's a sense of history because uh, both the, the uh, cities that I build in the yard or draw on the paper um, evolve over time because uh, nature starts to break them down. So I build them up again. And uh, I do the same thing with my language. It's, it's always in flux. I like to experiment with new things and see uh, what has more meaning for me? Yeah. Hello? Same thing. Um, oh. uh, sorry, yeah. there, there's some feedback occurring on your end, I think. Uh, oh. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just open up. Yes, sorry, David. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I, you're opening the floor for questions? I open question. for questions about the place of Collins in art. Yeah. For the panel. Talk. Do you want me to just talk or do you, should we get a microphone? Uh, I'll just talk. Just talk. And see if you hear me? Be loud. Okay. Uh, Stephen, let me know if you can hear me. That would be the question. Okay. Stephen, did you hear him? No, I can't hear anything. That's what I thought. Okay. Okay. I'll just. Uh, I'll say, so, no. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Whatever, just <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, I, I was wondering what, uh, and everybody can answer this, but I guess this is aimed at a couple people specifically. Um, uh, what you thought about my uh, very controversial statement that I just made when I was presenting the Smiley Award. I, I'm guessing Stephen Travis probably didn't hear that, uh, so I'll repeat it. Um, something that I seem to have noticed is that the combination of conlings with other media, which everybody here has done in, in book form, in movie form, in uh, your wild presentation, which I just love, um, and Stephen uh, Travis's art. Um, it seems that uh, for the general public, there's no way for a conling to be appreciated unless it's combined with another medium that we already appreciate and understand, like visual art or film or uh, music. Uh, we're talking about magma, for example, or cigarettes to an extent. Um, and so, that was kind of uh, the question I had, uh, what you thought about that, but also a few, a couple specific questions uh, for Stephen and for Baldwin. Um, Stephen, I was wondering, uh, the feedback that you've gotten specifically on your exhibits, is it mostly talking about the visual aspect? So in other words, you know, the, uh, the beauty of your pieces, maybe of your cities, as opposed to general interest in the language you've created. So that was a, a, a directed question at Stephen and for Baldwin. Uh, maybe this hasn't happened yet because Conling is just ah. debuting, correct? Uh, so we haven't gotten the reaction yet. But I am guessing, you know, provided that we, the LCS, can do anything to popularize this movie in the Conling community, uh, people are start going to people are going to know about Uskini, and that perhaps if there had been no movie, um, it might have just been another language that maybe people in the Conling community would know, but that nobody else has heard of. Uh, and what do you think about that? And I'll return the mic to whoever wants to go first. Um, on the, the, the 
the subject that you, that you brought up of uh, Collins having being involved with another media, I think that's certainly true now. Um, you know, for example, the people who study uh, Tolkien's languages are, you know, obviously are often fans of Lord of the Rings or Silmarillion um, or Klingon. You know, they're they're Star Trek fans. Um, I think it's I think it's difficult for you know, someone, a, a non-linguist, a person you know, in, in the general public to enjoy a conlang as an art form simply because it, well, the, the reasons are twofold. One, it takes, you know, a, a knowledge and understanding of languages to really appreciate this. You have to have some base linguistic knowledge to, to understand and appreciate what they've done. Uh, otherwise, it just, you know, to, it's just going to look like gibberish to someone if, if, if they don't, you know, appreciate, you know, the, you know, you know the, the subtleties of structure, grammar, morphology, etc. Um, and the other reason is that to enjoy it, it's a very, it, it's a very demanding kind of art, not just to create, but to enjoy. You have to, you know, sit down and read and read and analyze and think about this stuff to a degree that, uh, say, you know, you, 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 you have to, in some sense, become, you know, the way an academic would analyze, you know, a work of fiction. You know, most readers don't analyze it at that level, but to fully enjoy it, kind you have to. Um, I, I think that's the reason that, at least at the moment, the conlangs are a you know, somewhat uh, restricted uh, art form in terms of their audience. Can I add to that? <clears throat> yeah, go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, too. Um, I think the idea of having a movie about, about Con Lakes uh, is, is a really great way to start getting more people interested in it, because they'll probably be able to see this various places, including YouTube, where there's a, a, a large audience. And I think, um, well, you know, when I first started conlanging, well, first, I didn't even know there was a word conlang, and I don't think there was an audience at all when I started, uh, at least not that I was aware of. That was like uh, 40 years ago. But um, there seems to be increasing interest in it, and um, though people may not know the word uh, conlanging yet, uh, there's more opportunity on the internet and uh, even in bookstores. Uh, like the Serafinianus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, there are some pretty remarkable items that have come out. And bit by bit, people are being exposed to it. Um, one of the things that um, happened to me that was pretty surprising uh, when I was going to art school is um, I had an assignment to do uh, a study of values with uh, gouache paint and I purposely put that study, the homework, into my diary, which I was keeping in tapestry, the language I invented. Uh, it was a, a way for me to kind of like show off to the teacher what I'm doing, you know, but do it innocently. And um, what happened is he was so excited with it when he saw that. He said, this is your diary and this is your language, that he, he passed it around the entire school. It wasn't a large school, but he, he passed it around and I got so much feedback from there, which was a surprise. And it happened in a second art school, too. Um, so I think there's an audience out there, if they, if they see it, I think people are more uh, interested in that than, than we're aware of right now. Uh, at, le at least I hope, I hope so. Uh, Jim, could you please come up and just speak into my mic? Well, I'm here as a non conliner but I do sort of partial conlang things. 
And um, there's a newcomer to this community uh, talking about this subject about Conway and the arts. Um, I have some really strong comments. I would plead with you people. Um, there's a lot that would be wonderful to do that isn't really all that difficult mechanically. Uh, make a literature. This is really important. So, you know, those of you that, that have a Conway, write a story in it, write a poem in it, and do something with the LCS or whatever website where you're collecting this literature. Make a literature. And it, another thing that I would urge you to do is to compile things like untranslatable words that have this wonderful story. I'll bet every person here with a Conway has some word in that language which is almost impossible to translate and which in order to explain it to somebody, you have to tell a story. Capture those things. There, there are people, uh, I mean, I'm speaking as a poet, there are people all over the poetry world who mine this kind of stuff all the time and don't know about you. And uh, it isn't true. Please believe me, it is not true that a person has to go through all the pain that you go through in creating a Conway to appreciate what you do. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. And, you know, I found all kinds of wonderful things to find here that are going to take me months to digest. So, uh, you know, people are hungry for what you guys are doing. Um, I've actually given the presentation format of Conlangs uh, a lot of thought. And um, when I saw the Codex Seraphinianus uh, earlier, I was quite fascinated with it. Um, and I'm taking book binding as a part of my um, class. And, uh, uh, my school and um, I actually uh, my mind just started uh, thinking about like how I could maybe just make a book about my language or just the grammar but make it beautiful in a way that people could just appreciate it by just the fact that it would be beautiful enough okay I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making any sense I'm saying you, you, you don't really have to, I, I, want, I want to make something that you don't really have to read at all. You just have to look at it and, and maybe you'll read part, parts of it and find some of it fascinating. But you know these coffee table books that you don't believe? Maybe you just look at them? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's something that I'm thinking about at the moment. Uh, I, I'm at the very beginning stages of doing exactly that um, with Glide. And after 10 years of this, and, and wanting to just kind of, you know, I think of it sort of mundanely as a glide tutorial, but trying, you know, trying to frame that that thing. But that's part of the literature thing that I think Jim is talking about. Whereas somebody would sit and listen to French for hours and not really care what was said. 
or listen to music in another language and not really care what's being said. They would just hear it and beautiful. Um, I think if we had some kind of way to um, let people hear the things that we've created for those of us who have verbal languages, it might help. I wanted to comment on that um, as well. And I think that one thing we should examine in terms of mixing medias and making our, our languages available to the public in a way that's um, artistically intelligible to them is to look perhaps at the um, imaginary language you hear all the time on, um, I say, Lisa Girard or Ekova and a lot of these, uh, what I call musical glossolalists, in which these are, sp are spontaneous languages, if they have any meaning, uh, the Cocteau Twins, for instance. Um, yeah, dead contest. <laughs> but dead contest. Um, uh, it's kept secret. Um, so I'm quite interested in turning Tanoff into song songs and, and, and also um, composing music for them. Um, but I have another question, and that's for Steve again. Is he still on? Yes. OK. Um, I was quite impressed with your with your artwork. I, I was I was devastated too. Um, I wanted to know uh, what relationship you think making a tiny city and putting a language together has, because I have been ardently um, interested in my own fascination with the content uh, and the simulacrum. Uh, I too have made invented cities. My dream has been to make a little uh, uh, invented town in my backyard. Um, <laughs> and you're ahead of me. <laughs> I could kill you. And, um, <laughs> and I have always been, as I said, interested in making models. I'm working on a memoir now about my, um, about my investigation into why I do this. Um, robots, figurines cities, little tiny things, miniatures, and invented languages. So what is the relationship between the tiny city and the invented language? Well, um, I think um, one of the things about having a three-dimensional creation is that when you're actually sculpting it, it's still uh, pretty much in the uh, same vein of creating art as you would if you were painting uh, or creating a language. You know, you're, you're still creating something, but it feels different. Uh, even though you're, you're still expressing your, um, your inner feelings or whatever it is about language that uh, most appeals to you. When, when I'm sculpting, I have absolutely no fear. Um, and I don't have any fear when um, I'm paint when I'm um, making language, my tapestry. But I do have fear when I'm painting. But that's I still need to do painting though, because eventually, hopefully, uh, it will feel more natural in the future the more I do it. But I've always heard, and I agree with this, that a sculptor will improve on their work if they learn to also paint, and vice versa. If a painter um, starts to sculpt, it enriches their understanding of their painting, because they, they do overlap. And I, I believe the same is true for language, that uh, language is very much like painting and sculpting. Uh, probably, especially in your case, with Glide. Uh, unfortunately, on my computer, I, I'm, I Sally been able. <laughs> I'm Sally Caves asking this question. Uh, I didn't, oh, I didn't oh, invent slide, <laughs> which I wish I did. Yeah, I, um, I, I have, well, anyway, I apologize for that. Um, I haven't been able to get onto that one, but that's another case where someone's using uh, three dimensions, but it's even uh, more abstract because it's not something you can actually pick up and touch. So. There's so many different uh, uh, ways that uh, language can, language and art can merge. And so, you know, I, I really think it'd be great, and I'd love to see, you know, if you do start to build something in your backyard, you know, how, how that would 
how that would come about. It's so much fun. So in other words, you're talking about the two-dimensional versus the three-dimensional. Um, so that language can be two-dimensional and it also can be three-dimensional. Yes. I think, well, one of the things also that I love about building things in the backyard is that nature starts to destroy it. Yes. And so, you know, you cannot, you cannot make it stay stable. And um, at least my experience with language, creating language, I've been working on tapestry for three decades now, is that one thing I know for sure is that it is not going to ever acquire a space of being stable because I don't want it to be stable. I want it to keep uh, growing along with my own experiences of what language means to me. And the same thing for my city uh, that's in my yard is that nature takes care of that and the birds and the dogs. I mean, I've got a lot of visitors. And um, they each do their little contribution as a new plants. And I've watched the buildings change over the decades. Uh, my village is about 20 years old now. And so it takes on the coloration of the hillside, the, the leaves that stain the clay a different color. And certain things break down, and I have to build them up again. So there's a constant sense of regeneration. And I really like that. Thank you. Diane, thank you. Three dimensions. Why? Well, I think it just got said. Um, well, the, the, the thing, the ephemerality, you know, on different time scales <laughs> of these creations, like in, in working with the with the live performance video, which is making three-dimensional forms and making writing, I rarely record them. You know, I thought at first I had to save everything. Oh, I like that. I like, you know, and then and then I realized it was, you know, as I learned glide, and this is the fluency is is not so much the meanings, it's the how you make meaning. And it's a very it's a making ephemeral meanings. And and the statements are completely in that present moment. And they're they are understood in that way, and, and um, so I really like what you said about your your village becoming slowly uh, transformed in a ruin, <laughs> you know, even a romantic ruin. <laughs> um, so thank you. So for Diane, actually, in terms of life, you said something really beautiful yesterday where you needed to approach the language on, on its own terms. Because you were originally, you were trying to be forced translation onto it, and you're like, this is, it's demanding something from me. It needs to be approached on its own terms. I, I thought that was, was really kind of powerful. But um, I, th I think that's really important because it also relates to something that I think that Jim said it's really essential to know is that the process of, of creative writing in general, there were actually a lot of students, creative writing graduate students, who really wanted to be here at this conference and see what everybody was doing. They were very interested in your work in terms of like learning more about you know the writing practice and you know, um, exploring that. And I think that just a, a lot of times I've heard writers you know talk about the, the language it's kind of the same process of construction in some ways because you're getting it what the language wants from you. And I just I think that's a really beautiful concept. This is kind of a, a I want to toss this out as a question um, for everyone. And I mean, this is something I've noticed over the years, and I, I guess I just want to know if I'm on the right track. But I don't, I really haven't heard of any conlangs that aren't also associated with a culture in the world, world. I mean, con culture, I guess is a word, but is, is that a general truth as far as everyone? No. The okay. majority. The majority. But not. Yeah. Definitely. But I think that there's something significant in, in that, um, you know, when you, you have to think of it, I mean, the creation of an entire culture, including its art. Uh, I was thinking uh, on that. Um, I find it really difficult to just make a, a standalone language unless I project my own culture or some other existing culture onto it because there are all these things that you have to create, like words or 
um, uh, family relations or body parts or something that, if, if I don't make up a culture and um, that sort of uh, dictates how this turns out, I'm just really translating an Icelandic dictionary. Mm -hmm. um, you know? You, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So I, I find the two things completely interconnected. You can't really make a, a language without, uh, to me, I, I can't make a language without making something around it, making up speakers for it. Because otherwise it's sort of in a vacuum. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And uh, one of the areas in which a you know, an associated uh, mythology or history of the language, you know, can have a great impact is with uh, semantic change, um, especially with uh, place and personal names and how those, uh, how, how certain events or certain attitudes that the culture might have will end up feeding back on uh, the meanings of certain words. And, uh, you know, you know, try and transform uh, certain words from, you know, one meaning to another, you know, through history, by, by events, or uh, by certain people having those names. Um, it's, it, I don't think it's possible to separate, uh, it, or possible to do, you know, uh, you know, say that the, the history of words without some uh, history of the people who speak that language. Uh, you, I mean, you can do sound change, obviously, without uh, a, a history to reference, but, you know, semantic change, it's uh, difficult or impossible to do that and uh, do it realistically without a, a history to reference. We've got a question from Jim. Um, a couple of questions and comments. Uh, just first to your point about um, semantic change, um, Gezebun is not associated with a Kai culture, but I've been using it um, for frequently for um, seven years and occasionally for two years before that, and it's definitely undergone semantic change just through my process of using it. There are words that have expanded their meaning. There are words that have um, narrowed their meaning. There are words that have dropped out of use entirely. Um, so so that, that it does happen. And I've heard from a couple of people who make personal language or associated with the con culture, similar things happening. Um, the other thing, um, uh, to, to Diana's question, if I remember right, about two thirds of the people responding to my survey said yes, their coming is associated with the kind culture. About a third said no. I think of those saying no, most were making personal languages. There were two or three experimental philosophical languages like Ikquil and um, two or three Oxlangs. Then um, to the Adrian Rosenberg's idea of an anthology of Kantlang texts, if I remember it was right, um, a couple of years ago, um, David Peterson, if I remember right, said on the Kotlang list, it'd be good to have a um, book in a Kotlang, or a, a large text, along with a grammar and lexicon. Of, and um, I think we've got the seed for that kind of anthology in looking at the best of the initial relay texts. I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Starling Song and Don Quixote's um, philosoph short philosophical et essay in Equal for the relay before last. And, um, one other, this not coming to mind, uh, Roger Bill's Kosh wedding ceremony, for instance. We take some of the best of those and then add in uh, the other longer texts people have written um, that they do a relay style grammar and lexicon that's just what the reader needs to understand this particular text. We can do an anthology of those kind of texts. I, I love the idea of the relay. It's actually a, a I wanted. I always like to start a fight with the panel because that, and and something that I thought about a lot, and I don't have a, a final opinion on it. And we've discussed it occasionally in the LCS, and it's always 
really controversial. And, and it relates to a couple of things. Uh, but I'll start by saying that there's a notion of craft and you know, you know, what makes you a, a designer as opposed to someone who plays with fonts or makes you a painter as opposed to someone who dabbles uh, is a level of professionalism and finish. And it's, you know, that's what RISD students do. They start off drawing horses. You know, they will eventually be doing exactly whatever it is that they want to do, but they'll be doing it in a different way after a process. And, and there is a sense in which there are standards and recognitions of and we see this informally in Conlang, you say, well, that's just a relax, or he, it's English phonology, he just picked a random subset of letters from the alphabet, and you know, he didn't really know how a language works. And, and so there are times that people say and do those things. So I'm kind of curious about this role. It generally produces a lot of resistance when you say, well, well we're going to pick the best or whether we'll have an award, or two awards, or three awards a year, or something where we're going to pick someone. And it could become a horrible academic art kind of thing. But it's also one of the ways that evaluative function can be discouraging and can be destructive, but can also be very constructive in giving, you know, I won, you know, somebody got it. Uh, and, and it's not just about the poly, it might be the polish of the language or the productions. So I'm just interested in people's comments and opinions about that from the panel or maybe the audience. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, Jeff. There's also a question. Is it going to I have a suggestion. Um, since this is turning into a more of a general discussion, which was the point of this, in fact, mm -hmm. um, could I have you switch the tape, and could I have all of you just arrange the chairs in the uh, standard circle? Um, you know, it's uh, a little bit traditional, but sorry. Um,